edition of RCE. I am your host, Brock Palin. You can find us online at rce-cast.com. I also have Jeff Squires from Cisco Systems and one of the authors of Open MPI. Uh, Jeff is once again helping me out, and we've been a little delayed here, Jeff. Yeah, we've been a little little slackful here in the summer, in the summer doldrums, I guess, uh, that uh, we, we haven't gotten all of them out. But we've got a flurry of recordings coming up. I think we're recording three different podcasts within a week. Yes. And then measure. Yes. Yes, because... I am going to be at a conference for a week, the first week of August, about our topic today. I'm going to be at TerraGrid 2010, and we have with us two guests from TerraGrid. But before that, usual stuff. Jeff, you have some interesting new blog posts out. Since we haven't had a show, you have a couple out. Yeah, I do. Well, I've been a little slackful on my blog as well, and so I'm trying to put out a couple in a row to keep keep my stats up, keep my blog entries per month up because i get a little heat from that from the cisco pr department um but yeah actually so the, the last post i did was uh, i did a little play on the pop girl spice commercials and about half the people got it and about half the people didn't they're like why are you on a horse what does that have to do with high performance computer networking and but then you know the young ends like brock here got it and thought it was immensely funny so i feel my mission was accomplished <laughs> Yeah, you can find a link to Jeff's blog off of the RCE uh, website. So today our two guests are, we have Kay Hunt and Scott Lathrop. Um, They both work with TerraGrid in slightly different ways. I'll let them introduce and talk about what they each individually do. So Scott, could you take a minute and introduce yourself? Sure. So I'm with the University of Chicago and I'm the Area Director for Education, Outreach, and Training for the TerraGrid Project. And I'm Kay Hunt. I'm with uh, Purdue University, and I am with TerraGrid. been there for oh, about four years now, and my main interest and my main uh, tasks have to do with the Campus Champion Program uh, that's under the uh, Education, Outreach, and Training arm of TerraGrid that Scott uh, is in charge of. In full disclosure, I should inform that I am the University of Michigan's uh, campus champion along with Andrew Caird of the University of Michigan. So this is how I know Kay, and this was a little bit of an inside deal here before the TerraGrid conference. So could one of you explain exactly what is uh, TerraGrid for those who have never heard of it or maybe heard of it and not really sure? Sure, I'd be glad to. Um, so let me do the short version. www.terragrid.org will provide uh, a rich array of content and information. But TerraGrid is uh, funded primarily by the National Science Foundation and provides um, high-performance computing, supercomputing resources, if you will, in support of scientific research and education for uh, people across the country. Uh, it's primarily uh, for academic uh, research, so researchers from any U.S. institution that want to do computational science can request time and access to resources that are scattered currently across 11 different sites. So there are 11 different organizations that are formally a part of the Terragood project that's funded by NSF. Okay, so if a user wants to get um, started on the TerraGrid, what, what exactly are they looking at, uh, like contributing to a TerraGrid versus getting from the TerraGrid? What kind of services does the TerraGrid provide? So anyone that wants to use the facility um, can make a request uh, for time. The, the simplest is a startup account or an education account. Uh, And that's a request they can put in that's a fairly straightforward form they fill out. And nominally within two to three weeks, they'll have an account and they can start using the facilities. As I mentioned, the facilities span 11 different sites, but there's some 20 different computing systems. So there's a variety of architectures that they can get access to. And once they have access, uh, the, the, the researcher or the educator that may want to use this in a classroom activity uh, can uh, upload their, uh, their code and start running it and work on uh, optimizing the code. And then for a researcher who really wants to go full bore, then they can request additional time. The startup account is really to get them started, 
help them figure out which system or architecture may be most appropriate. And then they can request uh, a much larger allocation of time. So when you say an allocation of time, are these are CPU hours on a system? Or are these time with support people to help you work on a code? What, what exactly are the services? So a, a, an individual can request um, computer time on any of these systems. Uh, that would allow them, and I should say this time is all free uh, because it's funded by the National Science Foundation. Uh, they can request um, hours of time, which could be for a startup account uh, for the kinds of systems we're talking about, it would be nominally 30,000 hours of computer time. There are projects uh, today requesting millions of hours of computing time to do their research. In addition, uh, they can request a large amount of data storage if they're doing something that's uh, heavily data intensive. They can also request the time of some Terragrid staff to help them optimize uh, their code to to make the uh, to take the best advantage of the computing resources they're they're being provided. So, and, and then they can also request access to visualization servers so they can do uh, remote visualization of the the research they're doing to produce some visualization to to show others uh, the results of the, the calculations they're running. So when I first got involved with high performance computing as a student employee, uh, to swap in CPUs on old machines that were about on their way out, we were involved in something called NPACI, which was also a National Science Foundation a computing resource provider to people around the country. Is there a relationship between TerraGrid and NPACI? Yeah, so the, the, this program has actually evolved. Uh, it started out. Uh, with the National Science Foundation funding uh, what they call the Super Competing Centers back in uh, 1985, 1986. And there have been a number of programs that the National Science Foundation has funded since then. Uh, as you're referencing along the way, NPACI was an effort that was led by the San Diego Supercomputer Center, and there was a corresponding alliance program led by the National Center for Supercomputing Applications, or NCSA. Uh, those Pro those centers have continued to be involved, but the NSF program has continued to evolve. The, the TerraGrid program was the follow-on, uh, if you will, to uh, what NPACI and the Alliance offered to the research community. And uh, the, the TerraGrid program is just now uh, running into its sixth year of operation with funding from NSF. So in Comparison to others, we've just been talking about the various partnerships and a little bit of history there. Um, with, with TerraGrid, what is you know what is the sum to total of resources that you have? You mentioned number of organizations, but what kind of horsepower can uh, you know an individual researcher submit their jobs to? So it, it's an evolving landscape, and it depends, of course, on the funding from the National Science Foundation for TerraGrid, but. Today, there's over what we call a petaflop, the computing power with the various systems that are combined. And uh, and we know there are more systems that NSF will be funding. And in fact, sometime probably in the next couple of months, we'll hear about some additional systems that NSF will be funding to provide services to the community. Uh, collectively, TerraGrid is uh, providing as much computing power as any other um, operation in the U.S. for um, uh, free academic research and education. Um, but it's not to say it's the only op activity. Uh, Department of Energy also uh, supports major computing resources, uh, but the, their support is, if you will, mission-driven. Uh, uh, they support research that's ongoing in relation to the, the mission of the Department of Energy. NSF is really, if you will, uh, the most open academic research um, computing infrastructure that's available in the U.S. today. So when you say the, the most open, what exactly do you mean by that? Is this a, a members-only kind of club? Do you have to provide resources to get resources? Or, you know, how does a, an average Joe researcher who's got some number crunching they need to do and no machines to run it on, how do they, how do they get involved? So, so, again, it's open to any academic researcher or educator at any U.S. institution. 
Um, the, the time is free. They, ha they have to submit a, a, an application. Uh, as I mentioned, the startup applications can are usually quickly reviewed, and within a couple of weeks, they'll have an account. As someone scales up the size of their computing needs, uh, I mentioned earlier, some projects today are getting millions of hours of time uh, on an annual basis. Uh, those larger requests are reviewed uh, so that um, there's a balance of requests from across the country so we can balance the, the broad range of computing needs. But the, the research is literally open and encouraged to support all fields of uh, research, whether we talk about uh, weather studies, uh, climate studies, uh, bioinformatics, or whether we talk about uh, uh, social sciences or humanities. We encourage research um, by all fields of uh, study. So you talked about researchers can just regular U.S. citizens or um, can a corporation like rent time from NSF on TerraGrid resources or is it literally only the uh, uh, like you have to be affiliated with an institution? Well, you certainly have to have an affiliation with an institution. So academic research is uh, certainly the, the predominant uh, base of users. Uh, for industry, uh, industry is currently taking advantage of it, but it's a site-by-site -site agreement between industry and, and the site running the facilities. And that's because uh, what NSF is supporting is open research. So the research, the computing that's done in support of the research, all has to be published. For proprietary work, um, such as for industry, uh, since the work is not being published, they have to, if you will, uh, pay uh, for the use of the facilities. And so that's negotiated on a site-by-site -site basis. Uh, as far as... Uh, Joe Public or Sue Public wanting access, uh, that, that's not likely to occur um, because the, re the facilities really are for people that need high-end computing capability. It's not intended to supplant what you can get um, through your home computing or department computing or campus computing. It's really intended for people that need more resource than they can find on their local campus. So is there any groups out there that are similar to TerraGrid that are bigger? You mentioned Department of Energy has some. I know of the NNSA and a few other of projects. Is TerraGrid the largest organization of its type in terms of compute power and users? I think it's probably the largest in terms of total compute power and user base. Um, but there are other offerings. Uh, the Open Science Grid is one that um, is probably has more systems available uh, if you look at the the, the list of uh, organizations that are part of Open Science Grid. But collectively, their total compute power is um, probably not on par with what TerraGrid offers. Department of Energy is certainly one federal agency that's um, it's it's sort of an, a, a leapfrog effort uh, as NSF funds more compute uh, facilities. Department of Energy is also funding more compute facilities. So on an annual basis, who's got the most sort of jumps around. But there are other federal agencies, of course, that are also supporting research using high performance computing. Whether you talk about the Department of Defense or other agencies, there, there are multiple organizations and agencies that are supporting research. So this all in all actually sounds like a really great deal, especially for, say, junior professors in the early in their tenure track race and don't really have access to a lot of resources yet, but really need to do some computation at least to get started. For example, you mentioned the, the startup process and whatnot. Can you run us through a, a typical scenario of, um, you know, let's say I'm, I'm a Joe Average chemical engineer and I've got some numbers – to chunk, do I do I write an MPI application and, and then I, I submit it and it runs somewhere in the grid and I get the results back in a day or you know how does this how does the mechanics of actually running on the terror grid uh, work? So it's uh, I think we're sort of work from a basis that someone a researcher or someone teaching a course already has a code they're running perhaps on some whether it be on their desktop or some local cluster so. Generally, they're taking a code that exists, uh, moving it over the network to one of these TerraGrid sites. 
Uh, and then uh, they, they submit uh, batch jobs. Uh, the turnaround depends on the machine and, and how many other people are running. You know, debug queues, you can probably get jobs in and out uh, relatively quickly. It's for, But then if you're running a very large job, it could be something that runs overnight, or for some people it, it might even take a couple of days just because of the magnitude of the the, the size of the run they're actually uh, have submitted. But so someone would move the code up to one of these systems, um, you know, make a few runs, then probably do a fair amount of debugging. And then more than likely, they'll want to do some optimization because what they were running on a smaller cluster may not run as effectively on one of these other systems. So then they probably spend some time, uh, they are with their graduate students working on optimizing the code. And some of that may involve, you know, questions that they want to submit to the, the Terragood help desk. And there's a 24-hour outline where they can call and ask questions if there are problems. There are consultants available at these sites to help people with questions. And as I mentioned earlier, if they're getting a really intense uh, set of problems, they can request um, a more uh, dedicated uh, support from Terragood staff. But So the average user is uploading their, uh, their job, or uploading their data, running a batch job and then the results come back in you know depending on the size of the job you know whether it be a matter of minutes or hours depends on the size of the task and then they probably do some visualization locally or some analysis locally to say whoops need to modify the parameters need to modify the code and make multiple runs so it's not unlike running on the local cluster it's just that now you have more compute nodes available to run larger uh, more complex analysis when a user gets an allocation, is it all on, do they pick individual systems to go? Because there's, I notice there's some shared memory machines, there's some InfiniBand machines, there's some Cray machines where that you know don't support opening sockets, stuff like that. Or do you kind of say this and submit your job to some like grid meta scheduler? So nominally, a, a person requesting time would either request a specific machine because they're familiar with it or the architecture, or they may request uh, time on multiple systems. And for a startup account, it, it's, it, for some people, they may request two or three different architectures just to try their code out or because some portion of the code may rel, run well in one architecture and another portion of the code may run better on another architecture. So the startup allows them to do some of that testing analysis. Then when they go for the big runs and the larger allocation of time, they may select one or a couple of systems. Um, in general, I'd, I'd say the majority of people are running on between one and three systems. Uh, there's probably a small subset that run on more systems, but so it varies depending on uh, how, uh, how the complex the needs are and how much the the researcher wants to know about the intricacies of every system they're getting access to. So I notice a lot of the resources on the TerraGrid are really <clears throat> set up for low latency communication. They all use InfiniBand or NumaLink or the Cray C Star network um, based chip. What if you're a researcher and you need lots of horsepower brought to bear on an embarrassingly parallel parameter sweep, a serial? farming of serial jobs. What kind of resources does TerraGrid provide for that? So I would say that the mix of the community is all over the place. There are some people that have some very large serial jobs, but I think the, the predominance is people running parallel jobs. And, and we, we think about sort of the mix of systems out there. And if someone's really just looking for high throughput computing for a, a large sequence of serial jobs, uh, something like Open Science Grid actually may be more applicable to their needs. Uh, but for someone who's running a large, multi, you know, many uh, CPUs, many uh, processors, very uh, highly parallel, then the, the Terago systems may be more appropriate. But there are some research groups that actually find that running some of their jobs on Open Science Grid and some of their jobs on TerraGrid actually helps them to optimize their performance, their throughput, et cetera. And they sort of look at the, the mix of the type of job they're running to decide, again, which architecture, which environment is most appropriate. So there's no one answer. Um, and, uh, you know, the startup process is a way to sort of 
try that out, look at the different systems and figure out what the right mix is. And the consultants can help people uh, think through that and help make the right decisions. Let me ask you a question from the other side of the fence <clears throat> here now. So we've been talking about the researchers and the value that they get and things like that. What's in it for the providers? Um, so the, you know, the Purdue's and, and um, uh, University of Chicago's and others and whatnot, you provide resources that then basically, you know, people who are not under your control can submit jobs to. So what's the value proposition for, for you? Well, we, we get in this business because NSF's trying to support uh, the advancement of science. And so what the centers, what the sites that are involved in Terra get out of this is uh, the science that's accomplished. Or, uh, you know, I keep mentioning the education too, that the preparation of the next generation of scientists. Uh, but what we really look for are the publications, uh, the research, uh, the science that's accomplished by uh, the different individuals or the groups using these facilities. So the, the scientific um, outcomes are the critical component. And so we're always asking for publications reports uh, from uh, the people using the, the allocations. And when someone comes back for another round of allocations and more time, we always say, so what did you accomplish the first time around? Uh, show us the results of uh, the research you've accomplished. And we also put a fair amount of effort into uh, talking with these researchers to document uh, the science that's being accomplished because in the end, the National Science Foundation has to report back to Congress and others about what's, what's the impact uh, on science and science productivity. So it's that scientific accomplishment that these different research groups are able to demonstrate that's critical. Or, as I say, to the extent that we're helping faculty help their students learn how to become um, productive users of these techniques and methodologies to advance science. Uh, they're, they're all uh, critical outcomes in our estimation. Okay. Uh, let me ask a, another slightly different uh, direction question again here. So uh, Brock has done a, a podcast or two on uh, Blue Waters. What is, what is the relationship between TerraGrid and Blue Waters? Well, that's an interesting question, and it's really uh, been driven by, in part, by the National Science Foundation. They they, they funded the TerraGrid effort um, to do what we've been talking about, uh, and then they funded the Blue Waters project at, at NCSA at the University of Illinois to um, to uh, deploy uh, the single largest computing system available uh, through the, the collection of facilities. So the machine is not yet into production. In fact, the machine is still being designed and built by IBM. Uh, the machine is anticipated to go into production in 2011. And when it goes into production, the objective is to uh, support scientific research uh, in which the, the researchers have sustained petaflop performance on their application codes. So today, uh, what I mentioned was that Terga collectively has over a, a petaflop of computing power. The, the Blue Waters machine, um, because it, well, it will be uh, supporting sustained petaflop performance for a variety of scientific applications. So you can interpolate that to mean that it's, uh, that machine by itself will uh, have more compute power than all of Terra today. So it'll be the, the largest uh, machine in the NSF-funded uh, spectrum of systems. So is it going to be on the Terra grid itself, or is it a, a separate machine, separate entity, separate organization? Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. At this stage, it's still, it's not officially or formally part of Terra grid. It has a separate allocations process. Um, but yet, um, since NCSA is involved in both Blue Waters and Terra Grid, you can expect some of the, the same staff helping to support the community are uh, helping to support a community that's also using the Blue Water system. Um, and we fully expect that a number of the 
the users of the Blue Waters machine will have already been running codes on Terragrid, and what they're really looking to do is scale it up to yet a larger system. And so Terragrid uh, may be a stepping stone, for, if you will, for some of those projects. Uh, some of the projects may have been previously running on you know, DOE machines or other systems. But, but it really just suggests that it's the chance to scale up to yet a larger system within the NSF uh, community of uh, facilities. So users working with the TerraGrid, they're at their institution. Uh, the TerraGrid resources are remote across the country, including the support resources. Um, what what can uh, they do if they need to like sit down with somebody and get help locally um, and have someone actually like look at what they're doing instead of talking over the phone? Well, so the reality is most of the users are remote from these facilities. So it, the, the whole support system is designed to support remote users. Um, if we didn't or couldn't, we'd have a real problem. So um, the, the consultants are there to talk with them by phone, to exchange stuff through email. You know, if someone happens to be on the same campus or close to one of these facilities, and there's no reason they can't sit down with the staff there, but it's not uh, the optimal solution for most people, but but someone who's sitting on the campus of one of these sites, yeah, you know, they can certainly make an appointment with the support staff there. But but we the whole objective is to ensure that regardless of where you're sitting, you can get hopefully the same level of support and assistance. So I'm a member of the Campus Champion program where I can help out people and have access to all of the TerraGrid resources and guide people along locally on my campus as a the, my campus's advocate for TerraGrid and, and support for that. Uh, Ter Kay, you're kind of my uh, supervisor in the, in this role, so can you explain exactly what the Campus Champion Program is? Sure. Um, the Campus Champion Program is a relatively new program. Um, we enlisted the help of Campus Champions, the first ones in May of 2008, so we're just about a little over two years old now. And this is a program where we try to identify uh, at an institution a local representative uh, who will be a um, outreach person, a user support person, a feedback type person uh, for their campus. So we found that uh, some people when they go uh, to look for resources don't even know that the TerraGrid resources exist. So we use our campus champion, the person that's been identified at that institution, to help with outreach to let others know what the TerraGrid is, uh, how they can get access to it. And we've also found that some people, even though they know about it, think it's uh, uh, maybe hard to get uh, an allocation uh, on the tear grid. So we've asked our campus champion to help expedite that process uh, and to help the local researcher to get their allocation without a lot of red tape and, uh, and to answer questions along the way. Uh, we feel like that's uh, helped um, move the program on a little bit. The other thing we ask the campus champions to do uh, is to feedback to the TerraGrid staff areas that they feel uh, need some upgrading, need some change, need some more definition so that the uh, resources that we have available uh, in the user services area can be more reliable, more useful to the researchers that are out there. So it's really a three-pronged thing that the champions uh, try to do for us, that outreach, uh, some hand-holding, and some feedback. Um, and we found that this has been fairly successful on most of the campuses where we do have a champion. I see. So it's not so much that, you know, Brock can help his local users with, say, the TerraGrid resources at Purdue. He's more of a gateway of information in, in at least one of the three prongs here that can get the, the user in touch with the relevant help at Purdue or whatever resource they're using on the TerraGrid. Is that exactly? Is that uh, correct? We 
Exactly. We can't expect our campus champions to be the know-all and the, the absolute answer to everything, but we can give that champion direct access to the user support staff, to the other TerraGrid staff, so that any user who needs particular help can get a direct link to uh, the qualified help that he needs. Yeah, I've actually done a number of things on our local cluster, learning about TerraGrid to make our local resources integrate better with TerraGrid. I've set up some of the uh, Globus, my proxy stuff to be able to make transferring data between our system and TerraGrid systems easier because we see TerraGrid as yet another resource that enables research computing at Michigan. So we, we combine all these things together. Exactly. We we hope that the campus champion won't just be a TerraGrid person. We hope that a campus champion could sit down with a researcher at, say, the University of Michigan and say, okay, what are you trying to do? Here's the resources that we have locally. Here's the resources that we have nationally. What's the best track for you to take, and how can I help you get there? So it sounds like that's what you've done, Brock, there at the University of Michigan. Yes, that, but I've also made it so that people can kind of prototype their stuff on our local system and very easily <clears throat> using grid FTP between the systems, um, move data back and forth, log in back and forth, and just try to make our system interoperate with yours a lot better. And so that's yeah. kind of one of the, the intrinsic values that we really have been touched on here is that uh, TerraGrid, they're all kind of at least connected in, in some way. I wonder if somebody could explain that a little bit, that if I run on one system, it's not as difficult perhaps to run on a different TerraGrid system. For example, I think we mentioned earlier, if my needs have scaled up, okay, you know, now I know what I'm doing. I've, I've prototyped my code. I've gotten some preliminary numbers, and but now I've got a bigger allocation and I can run elsewhere. Is it a difficult or an easy hub or how do one how do people typically migrate to other resources yeah i think you'd have to ask the individual researchers how difficult or, or easy that is um, i think that we've tried to make that easy and that you start at your local level and maybe with a small amount of data and and you really have this larger job you do you want to do but you can't get that done at your local resource so you need to transfer data to the national resources scale up your code, and if you've gotten all the little details worked out on the local level, it's generally pretty easy to scale up. Now, there's differences in compilers, there's differences in, in uh, some data structures and so forth, so there may be some hurdles for you to go over, but when somebody's done something like Brock has done, uh, he makes that transfer, uh, hopefully, uh, as easy as possible. The other thing I would add is there's been a lot of work, and there's actually a working group to address creating a common user environment. So as you move from one system to another in TerraGrid, the, the objective is to you know the file make the file structure look similar across the systems, et cetera, et cetera, so that it's uh, less painful, if you will, to move from one system to another because the environment is more consistent across each of them. And I have heard, I will add to that, some of our campus champions uh, who are very excited about the common user environment, and it has uh, helped them a lot to make those transitions easier. So if we have a researcher listening to this show and they want to see if their campus already has a campus champion, how can they find out who their champion is? So they would need to go to, they can go to teragrid.org, and on that page we have a link to the campus champions, and they are all, all the campus champions that are currently working are listed, their institution is listed, and their email address is listed so that they could be contacted by the, the local person if they wanted to. And hopefully the champions on those um, Campuses have also done some marketing of their own, uh, some communication of their own to the research staff um, at their own institution. But if, if they don't know, they can certainly go to teragrid.org and find out who it is. Currently, we have uh, 69 institutions that are engaged with the program. So uh, if they find that their institution doesn't have a campus champion, who, who qualifies to become the champion for the institution? 
So if uh, they they look for a champion and they don't have one, and maybe they're interested in getting one at their uh, organization, also at terragrid.org, it has all the information about how you could become a champion. And basically that's a uh, simple um, piece of um, – let me say that again. That's a, that's a simple route to take. Um, what they would do is they can send a piece of email to um, the email address that's listed on the website. That comes to me, actually, um, and they express their interest. We talk um, and, and ask uh, what it is they want to do and, and what they uh, want to get out of this. We do have a memorandum of understanding that we do um, – get signed and authorized, usually by someone that's uh, in the upper administration of the university. Um, reason for that is we'd like to have the upper administration to, number one, be aware that the program is going on and be supportive of it so when they hear about it on campus, they can, they can add their support when, when appropriate. Um, and that memorandum of understanding just says uh, what it is we expect the champion to do and what it is the TerraGrid will do for the champion, which is something we haven't talked about yet, but uh, we should. Um, and then we sign that memorandum of understanding, and, the ter and that person becomes a champion. At that point, we try to go through an orientation pro uh, process with the champion to get them integrated into the program if they're not really familiar with the TerraGrid. We have training available and resources for them to access. Um, we have a monthly conference call. Um, we have the yearly uh, conference, which if you've mentioned, Brock, already is uh, coming up in a week here, where we get the champions together um, and try to support their needs. So the thing that the TerraGrid tries to do uh, for the champions is to give them the direct access to user support, give them access to documentation and training, actually come to a campus and help with an outreach event or a training event where that seems uh, needed and, and relevant, um, and provide uh, materials uh, that would be helpful to the champion as well. So we should say there's no cost to a campus to be a campus champion, but in the process of selecting who is the champion on the campus, we like to work with the campus to make sure that someone that who's really reaching out to and supporting the local research and education community so that SK says they can help spread the word and, and, and be there to help support the researcher, as she said, trying to figure out of the various national resources available, uh, which, which are most optimal for the, the individual or the group. So... Moving on from that, what comes after the Terra Grid? I know these projects tend to be on a, you know, a five-year or a three-year or a ten-year kind of thing. What's what's the future for Terra Grid? So that's an interesting question because right now there's a solicitation out from <clears throat> the National Science Foundation for what they call Terra Grid Phase Three or otherwise called Extreme Digital. Um, they're, so there's, they're going through the process now of, um, I mean, I sh should actually say there's a couple of proposals that are just recently been submitted. So the deadline for submission has just passed um, like a week ago. And so NSF is going through that review process now to um, select uh, activities to extend TerraGrid on for the next five years. Uh, it's intended to build on, of course, the success that's been uh, accomplished to date, but also look at ways that the program can improve to better serve the research and education community and campuses moving forward. So it's a little premature to give you an answer what it will look like because it will depend on what NSF uh, funds, but the, the it's expected that NSF will be making these decisions and a new set of activities will start up in approximately the April 2011 time frame. Um, so I, I was going to add two things. You know, we've already talked about the Terragrid conference coming up uh, the week of August 2nd. Tell you what, hold, hold on. Uh, give it a beat and then, um, you know, just give a little pause and then uh, launch into it. That allows Brock to splice it in pretty easily. Oh, sorry. 
So I just want to mention that um, the Terrigree Conference is an annual event. Uh, this year it's the week of August 2nd. There's also a very strong NS uh, Terrigree presence at the annual Supercomputing Conference. The SC10 Conference is coming up in November in New Orleans. All the Terrigree uh, sites uh, participate in that conference each year. And then we, we try our best to get to as many professional society meetings as possible throughout the year. And as Kay mentioned, any campus that would be interested in uh, having Terrigood visit to share more information, uh, conduct a local uh, training session, we are always happy to explore those options as well. So there are lots of ways to interact with and learn more about what Terrigood is doing. And we'd love to hear from your audience what we can do to help support them. Thank you. That sounds great, and uh, we really appreciate your time today. This sounds like, like I said earlier in the, in the interview, this sounds like a great deal. So if uh, you're an academic researcher out there and you're not taking advantage of the period, it sounds like you should. So I, I think we covered a lot of ways to, to get involved. And if your audience is uh, predominantly uh, students, this is a good time to, for them to go nudge their advisor to say, hey, maybe we ought to get involved. All right. Well, I think that about wraps it up. Um, we appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you.